little something from our amazing speakers. Um, I'm helping to organize the marketing track during Austin Startup Week, and so we've set up a series of essentially five events in combination with other events around the city focusing on marketing, and we've really uh, leveraged our personal <laughs> networks and networks within the community to bring really quality speakers um, to these events, and this, this event in particular is no exception to that. Um, I do want to thank some supporting meetups. These are meetups who have helped with Austin Startup Week by promoting this event and other events in this series and, and generally with Austin Startup Week, including BASH, the big ass social happy hour. It goes down, I believe, once a month, uh, run by a woman named Lonnie, and really, really awesome event for networking. Um, I'd also like to thank Awesome, which actually takes place here at Capital Factory once a month. They also help promote some of the events for Austin Startup Week. If you want to check out that meetup, uh, you can go to literal.co forward slash awesome, and that's their meetup page. Uh, and then I also want to thank Austin Digital Jobs. Where's Ollie? Ollie's here in the audience. Thanks, Ollie, for helping to promote this event. But if we give a round of applause for those supporting organizations, we really appreciate it. I uh, also want to thank the supporting organizations who, who helped with this. Capital Factory, this, the Austin Startup Week, the Startup Crawl, all of these things would not be happening without the support um, that they give to the Austin Startup Week crew, including Jacqueline and, and those folks. Um, so we're so really thankful for the, the space that they provide and, and even just the, the human hours to have people at the door, help organize and, and work with speakers and, and venues. Techstar is also a supporting organization. And then I also wanted to thank WP Engine, which is the company I work for, but wanted to thank them for also providing space and, and supporting us and me involved in this volunteering effort and allowing our staff to be involved and, and help to organize these things. There's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes, and, and these organizations invested their time into that and, and took focus away from their business to focus on the community. So thank you to those folks. So um, the presentation today is around advanced online marketing, and we're going to talk about two topics. We're going to talk about search, and we're going to talk about affiliate marketing. So I'm, I'm guessing that some of you have exposure to SEO. So, so can I get a show of hands if you've done SEO or PPC in your career or in your business? Okay, so a good amount. And then what about affiliate marketing? How many people have used affiliate marketing to drive sales for their business? I see some familiar faces in the back. And uh, so not a lot of hands. So you guys are actually in, in for a treat. You're gonna learn more about how affiliate marketing works and, and what you can do to, to, to use that to drive your business. So that's where we're gonna start. And our first speaker I met at a networking event here in Austin uh, originally, or I guess maybe not very first time, but, but the first time I really got to know him was at Internet Marketing Party. If you guys have ever been to that, it's another networking event that happens once a month. And um, this gentleman runs a conference called Affiliate Summit. It's actually the largest conference on affiliate marketing in the world. And it takes place twice a year, once in Vegas here in January, and then um, in New York, generally in August. And a uh, really smart guy, knows a lot about affiliate marketing, a lot about both the merchant side, the advertiser side, and the affiliate side, the publisher side, the people that drive the sales. And so you guys are in for a real treat today. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Mr. Sean Collins. Thank you, David. Um, so today I'm going to talk about from the merchant side how to launch an affiliate program and just go through the whole process in, um, in a quick and easy um, manner here. So uh, let me just jump into it. And also, as David mentioned, I'm, my name is Sean Collins. I'm co-founder of Affiliate Summit. I've been in affiliate marketing since 1997 as an affiliate straight through for the last almost 20 years and I spent about 10 years as an affiliate manager and then just uh, been running the conference since 2003. Um, so if you're unfamiliar with the way that affiliate marketing works, I know you can't really see this, but, um, but it's, this goes through the whole process, but uh, the slides are all on Twitter. I just posted them a little bit ago on at affiliate tip if you want to see a, a better picture of this. But basically the, the whole concept of affiliate marketing is that somebody who has some kind of a website or some social accounts as an influencer or an email list, they join up an affiliate program, say, for example, Amazon, and then they go and they post whatever their, their site or their list is, a, a link relevant to whatever their content is, and then um, and up here, the little green guy, we'll call him Jack, he visits that, that site and he clicks through to the merchant site and he gets cookied at that point, and he, when he goes to purchase something on that site, then that, that transaction relates back to the affiliate who referred him. And so then they get a, say, a 5%, whatever the commission is. It really varies depending on anywhere from 
like 1% up to around 50% from computers to online downloadable software and different things. But so after the whole transaction takes place, the affiliate has a unique ID, so they get a, a commission for that transaction. And they, they usually go through a, a third party affiliate network, and they, that network provides the reporting and the tracking and all of that. And so at the end, usually in monthly increments, they get paid in a variety of ways through PayPal, checks, wire transfers, different things. But so that's sort of in a nutshell the way that the whole transaction works. Um, here's a, a list of the, the top 10 e commerce retailers based on a, um, a report from eMarketer. And so one thing they all have in common is that they all have affiliate programs. And if you go deeper down the list, I just didn't want to list 50 or 100 companies, but just about 100 or so percent of these companies that are the top e-commerce players all have affiliate programs. So it's sort of a testament to how it, it, it works. It's a very effective channel. And obviously, the Amazons and Walmarts and Apples wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't working for them. And Amazon's one of the early players. They got into it, I guess, in about 95 or so. And so they've been going straight through ever since. Um, and as far as your company, if you need an affiliate program, the, I have a bunch of data here from a report I do called AFSTAT. And this, um, hopefully you can read this, it's sort of small. But um, it just lists the different channels that affiliates report that they like to promote. And so like the computers, electronics, clothing apparel, online services, and on down the list. But so um, pretty much any niche affiliate marketing can work. And, um, and as far as, I guess, computers and electronics are pretty obvious clothing. But um, online services, that can really vary from all sorts of different things. One that I used recently, I, um, I made the mistake and I was speeding a little bit here and I got a ticket and I came across a company called Aceable. It's local where I had to do the six hour course to undo my ticket damage. And, um, and they have an affiliate program. I saw that after I, I was going through it. So I, um, I was thinking that it's a pretty lucrative area so I might have to create a site for, for people that have to take their defense and driving classes like I did. But um, it's, that's neither here nor there. Um, as far as what an affiliate is, usually the conception is that they're just like a, a website, but um, based on the AppStat data here again, this is the way that, different ways that affiliates are driving traffic. And so SEO is one of the most common ways, social networks, blogging, and um, on down the, to the end there, the last ones are comment marketing and guest posting. I've pretty much done everything except for those two. The comment marketing is a little bit skeezy to me, but, but some people are doing it, and I guess to some levels of effectiveness. But, um, but really, so affiliates are really leveraging any kind of marketing out there to, to promote their affiliate links. So they're not really pigeonholed into one type of person. Um, but if you decide you want to get an affiliate program, it's urgent or really um, very important to, to have your site just fully functioning first. A lot of people try to race out there and they have a brand new site and they want to have the affiliate program out of the gate because they're just so hyped up about getting those leads in there. But it's really, really important that you have the, everything locked down, that you have all the conversions working out well, there's nothing broken, and you just have everything tested. So go there and do some paid search and just make sure that your transactions are working well and that you, you have a very effective conversion process. Because the affiliates, if they go there and you're using them as the test bed, they're not gonna last too long if they're not getting any conversions and they're gonna walk away and they're not gonna come back. So make sure you have everything all in good working order before you try to get the affiliates in the door. As far as tracking and reporting, there are a wide array of networks you can use to track your affiliate program. These are a bunch of the more popular ones. And um, it comes down somewhat to preference. I, I have accounts with all of these. I, I tend to promote affiliate programs that are in ShareASAL, um, CJ Affiliate, used to be called Commission Junction, and Rakuten LinkShare, but that's just because the companies I tend to promote are in those networks, not that I really prefer those networks. And they, um, they all have some pluses and minuses, but. It's uh, on the merchant side, it really comes down to what works best for you, whether it's the um, technology they're offering, the reporting, if they have a certain kind of niche they cater to, their price point. So it's, it's a good idea just to take a test drive of all these different solutions and see which one is best for you. Um, as far as an affiliate manager, there are two routes you can go for that. There's having an in-house affiliate manager for your program or an OPM. And the OPM stands for an outsourced program manager, which is basically an agency. As far as, um, they both have pluses and minuses. The in-house affiliate manager, it's great because they're dedicated to your affiliate program. But the tricky thing there is that they're, it's a pretty limited talent pool. And unless you're in a fairly big city that has a, a lot of affiliate managers out there that you can poach from other companies, there aren't a lot of people that have the, the unique skill set to go there and promote your company, especially for whatever your niche is. 
but the but a great thing there is that you do have them in house if you like to manage them in person and, and all that. The OPMs, on the other hand, they uh, they're usually managing multiple affiliate programs, maybe as much as five or ten, and um, but usually it's you're paying a little bit less and you you hit the ground running because they they've been doing this so many times over and over again. So they have relationships with so many affiliates and and with the networks. So there's not really that that lead up time to get things going. You can just pretty much start your affiliate program on day one. So the OPM is nice in that regard. And I, I spent a number of years as an OPM and, and also as an in-house affiliate manager. And I personally, I, I think the OPM model is great just because you can get started faster and a lot of people are impatient about their results. Um, as far as why affiliates pick a, a given affiliate program, there are a lot of different reasons. I, um, for me personally, my first reason is to, I, I want to, I have a certain need I have to solve, so I'm trying to find a particular niche or a, a brand that I want to promote, so I just go straight to that brand, but but also I, a lot of these different factors weigh in as well, just the, the EPC, the commissions, the cookie duration, and so um, so really it's a lot of this stuff weighs in. A lot of um, affiliate programs might have a, a lousy conversion rate, and they but they jack their commission up to twice as much as their competitors. And they think that's going to seduce the affiliates, but once they come in there and see that the conversion stinks, they're not going to last. So the EPC is really a, a vital thing for for the affiliates. And if you're not familiar with that, it's the earnings per click. So it's just basically it, it bakes down to how much the affiliates are making for each click they're sending to you. Um, and you need affiliates. So uh, when you have an affiliate program, and I really emphasize that you need quality, not quantity. And um, years ago, many years ago, actually back in the 90s, 99, there was a conference called Affiliate Solutions. A guy named Tim Choate was the keynote from a company called Free Shop, which their whole model was giving away free stuff and one of those bubble things going on back then. But they, um, he was doing this keynote and he announced that he had this big benchmark they'd, they just passed. They had 100,000 affiliates and the crowd erupted. They were going nuts. They were standing ovation. And um, everybody was so worked up about this 100,000 affiliates, and I, I think Free Shop was gone about a year later. And, um, and it was just a, but at that time, people were just so stuck with the vanity metrics of how many affiliates, and 100,000 or 50,000 affiliates made so much impact with their CMOs, and um, it didn't matter if only 1% of them were doing anything. But so you, the typically, it's um, like maybe like a 98-2 principle with 2% of affiliates that are doing most of the work, and that's, but that's for affiliate programs that aren't really highly managed. But if you focus on getting the quality affiliates and just getting very targeted people and nurturing them, then you can really push that number in the right direction. And uh, a key thing is to, to help affiliates um, find you. So the two big orange ones here, the affiliate program information on their site and also to be, in a, to be listed well in the search engines, those are the two that, that I think are most important, and obviously the other affiliates do too. But so the first one there, if, I, if there's a certain merchant that I want to promote, I just go to their site and I go down to the footer and hopefully find a, a link that says affiliate program and I click on it and join. And um, bless you. Um, and then otherwise, the an important place we'd be indexed is in Google under, say, if, if I'm looking for a luggage affiliate program, I'll be quiet. Um, I'll, I'll go and search Google luggage affiliate program and see who comes up. And so a lot of affiliate programs don't optimize for that, but tons of affiliates are looking for affiliate programs that way. So it's huge to, to be in the top three there, or top five, or whatever, four, whatever your niche is for affiliate programs. So focus on that, as well as just having a very obvious link on your footer. And for whatever reason, some, of, some merchants don't have their link to their affiliate program on their footer or anywhere on their site, which boggles my mind, because I don't know how they think, figure people are going to find them. Um, one of the, in the, the many years that I was managing affiliate programs, one of the most effective tools that I used was direct mail, which seems sort of counterintuitive for an online program. But um, I mean, obviously you're getting great, assuming you build a good list, you're getting great open rates. And so what I would do is I would just create these cheesy postcards that had like maybe like three value propositions about the affiliate program, the EPC, maybe the network I'm on, some other information, and, um, and just some information about joining. And then also just to track it, I would tell these targeted affiliates I was trying to reach out to email me when they were joining, and then I would give them a jack up that commission a little bit, and so I could see the effectiveness. And I did this across a dozen different companies, and it worked so well each time because nobody else is doing it. And so 
a lot of people are just trying to do paid search for recruiting affiliates or doing emails and and this was the most effective for me and the best ROI and so I would highly recommend that um, and educate your affiliates a lot of people they when they recruit their affiliates they just figure that's the end of the game they're in the door they're gonna promote us and it's gonna be all great but the, it's highly important to actually work with your affiliates and educate them on the, the best ways to promote your company. You know a lot better than they do. They're coming in cold, so you want to help them to sell the best they can. And um, just look at them as a sales team. A lot of people look at affiliate marketing as another media buy, but it's not. It's really you're working one-on-one -on -one with these people to try to get them to promote you. A few things I would recommend is to create a resource site, just a basic site where it has the, an archive of your newsletters, some samples of your creative and those sorts of things and they'll help the affiliates to be able to dig back and get information about things. An FAQ that actually is a real FAQ, one where you're answering questions the affiliates are actually asking you on a regular basis instead of what you think they should know. And then a sales guide. This is a, a really important one that I've only seen just a, over almost 20 years a handful of affiliate programs ever do. But basically you look at these people as actually being your salespeople and treat them as such. Give them a, a very simple guide, maybe five, 10 pages where it talks about your highest selling products or services, your, your demographics that you're targeting, uh, history of the company, just treat them like a, an employee because they, they have the power, some of these people with big lists, big sites, to really have a great impact for you, but they need your help, they need your guidance to, to be most effective. So, so treat them like a sales team and, and you'll see some great results there. Also, be an affiliate yourself. This is um, something that has a, a couple different positive attributes to it. The one thing is that you get sort of a, a 360 degree knowledge of what it's like to be an affiliate. You know what their pain points are, the experience on that end, and especially if you've never created a site yourself, to just the, some of the frustrations on the affiliate end. And also it's great for some competitive research because if you actually create a, a real site in your niche, you can apply to your competitors. And uh, if it's a decent site, then they'll accept you. And then you can go in there and you can see how they communicate with their affiliates, their newsletters, the different content they're putting out there. In the affiliate networks, a lot of times they show what the most effective creative is. So you can sit there and sort of write off what they, what's working for them and see what their best creative is, the most popular sizes, the messaging and different things. So it's, um, it's a, a great way to just get some intel on your competitors. Um, retaining affiliates. So that's, um, that's something that a lot of affiliate programs fall down on too. So, and just like, if they were an employee of yours, you want to, it's a lot more expensive to bring in new affiliates constantly and try to train them. Instead, once they have them in the door, take care of them and make sure they want to stay there. And um, some things that I've done in the past, uh, go to conferences. I'm not totally objective there since I, I run one, but it's a great way to be in person so you can just get some face time with these affiliates, maybe just a, a 10, 15 minute meeting or a lunch or something, just so you can just work out some things in person. Just so much more effective than on IM or or on email or whatever, and uh, make it easy to contact you. A lot of affiliate programs will just send out uh, their newsletters and different communications, and they just sign it affiliate manager, and all you have is just like contact or affiliate manager at abc.com. But uh, make it as easy as possible to reach you because you want to your success. Their success is your success. So, so put out your phone number, your email, your IM, whatever, so they can reach you. And similarly, share your information in many places. Don't just put the information for your affiliate program where it's convenient for you, the different mission critical information about sales and things. Put it on your newsletter, on your website, on the page for the affiliate program, add on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. Just make it as available as possible so affiliates can find it where they want to find it. Um, and direct mail again, that's something I use not only to recruit but also when the affiliates were in the door. And so depending on what your seasonality is, if Q4 is huge for you or maybe summer or Valentine's Day, just drop a postcard to them and just push them to get those links up for whatever that, that big time is for you. And it's, uh, I found that to be way more impactful than trying to send out emails and especially Q4, they get so swamped with emails from every affiliate program and, and I belong to probably over 100 affiliate programs so I just filter them all right to a folder and don't even look at them for the most part. So um, a direct mail, they can't really help but see that if you have the right address. And then custom creative, it's a relatively cheap thing but a lot of affiliates appreciate that if they have a unique size or they just want to have something that's co-branded just provide that to maybe the bigger affiliates or even some of the small ones who can become bigger and um, it's a nice way to just sort of engender some goodwill with them and promotions incentives like uh, just have some various contests and things to keep them engaged 
and not just like a top five sales of the month or whatever, because that's only going to reward the same people over and over again. And also have some things that maybe you just have to have some kind of mild participation, like just at least have like X amount of sales per month and you're qualified to, to get whatever this prize is. So you can really engage the, your whole base and not just the, the top players and hopefully try to build up those smaller guys. Anyway, um, I say I blew that pretty quick. Uh, my name is Sean Collins. You can reach me in these different ways, Sean at AffiliateSummit.com, Affiliate Tip on Twitter and Facebook slash Sean Collins. But uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer any questions now or if you wanted to reach me offline. And again, um, all these slides are on, they're on the, the RSVP page for the event here, but also at Affiliate Tip on Twitter. So um, do anybody have any questions about getting an affiliate program going? What's that? How do you know where to set your commissions at? It really varies because like, um, uh, yeah, uh, sorry. Um, so I was asking where do you set your commissions at? So like for instance, somebody who's selling computers, oftentimes they'll be around like maybe a half percent or 1% because it's a high ticket item. But then if you're looking at like a lot of retailers, they're somewhere between five and 10% for like clothing or different hard goods. And then all the way up to like downloadable software can be 50% or more or like a, just anything digital like that that doesn't really have the big overhead. So it's um, the, the best way to do it is to go and look at your competitors' affiliate programs and, and see what they're doing. And if, if at all possible, try to beat them. But one thing to bear in mind is that you don't want your highest commission to be the one you publicize because you say you, you can afford to pay 10%, but put 5% publicly because then the big affiliates, the, the so-called super affiliates, you want to be able to have some wiggle room to give them more to get them to participate. So, so publicize a lower one, but have that room to pay as a higher amount to the bigger players. Yes? Is there any tips or tricks to recruiting some of the bigger uh, affiliates to get them signed up? Um, so he's asking if there are any tips or tricks to recruit those bigger affiliates. And, um, and one of them is just to basically to, like they're gonna, the bigger guys are, are gonna have all the programs in the radar, so the best thing is just to be sort of best of breed and to have the quality conversion rate and, and, and all, the, all the things like that, and also it sort of, sort of helps to have a, a respected brand. But um, so one- a new company. Okay. Yeah, so new company. So, um, so one big thing there is to, so you have the option you can get like a, for a lower cost, have an installed software to track things on your site. But um, the affiliate networks, they're gonna cost more money, but it, it gives some, somewhat of a level of trust and also convenience for the affiliates. So like for me, with the exception of Amazon and eBay, I'll only join affiliate programs that are in a network because I, I don't want to have to deal with tracking and reporting on 15 different platforms or 100 different platforms. And also, so it, it unifies all the reporting and tracking and also the payment, so I can just get one wire from Commission Junction, one wire from Share Sale instead of 30 different wires that have to deal with their checks or, or whatever. So, it, so the networks make a big difference to me. So, so like, <coughs> so the company that I'm working with right now, they run their affiliate program through something like Infusionsoft, which is, a, they have their own internal Yeah, and I guess um, part of it's the, what the budget will, will really yield there, but I, for me personally, if I see an Infusionsoft or, or like a home-baked right. tracking, it, it turns me away unless it's a company that I really desperately want to promote. But if, I, if it's just, if I'm promoting five different hosting companies or something and, and four of them are networks and one of them's not, the one that's not, I'm not going to bother with. Yes? Um, have you seen any non-monetary compensations work with affiliate marketing? And if so, which ones are the most effective? Bless you. Um, so have I seen any non-monetary compensation? So I've seen a, a combination of the two. There are some companies like Amazon has offered for a while that you could get a credit in the store. And I haven't seen that too prevalent, but I, there have been a handful of companies that give the store credit. And to me, that's valuable because I, I shop at Amazon three times a week. So it's just as easy, since the money's gonna go there from some source, I might as well just have it flow back to me so I can just have that store credit anyway. But I guess it depends on, and it's good to, ideally the people that are promoting you are gonna be your customers or, right. so, um, so they're gonna, they'd be happy with that. But it, you should have an option, and as many options as possible. So not just have like um, check and, and wire, it's great to also, especially for um, a lot of international affiliates prefer PayPal because they have to deal with all the, the fees and things if they get a check or, or something with their banks. Yes? Well, one of the challenges we've seen with, with a number of affiliates is that all the attribution is last click. So you might have a demand creation affiliate that brings somebody to a shopping cart, and then there's that open box, and it's all tab browser search, and then Connor Cunningham and Retail Me Not stomp out the, the, the real affiliate, add their coupon tax when they were going to buy anyway. Are, are you aware of any tracking software in the networks that allows people to change the attribution? 
Um, there's a lot of discussion, uh, sorry, um, he was asking if there are any technologies that, that account for attribution. So if somebody, a coupon seller, somebody comes in and sweeps in and takes that transaction at the last minute. Um, I haven't actually worked on the, the affiliate management side in a couple of years. I'm not sure what the, the current technology is, but I, um, they're all talking about it. So I'd imagine, I'm sorry I don't have a good answer there, but I'd imagine they're, they're working on it. But one thing to that end is, uh, for different types of affiliates, like a coupon affiliate, like Retail Me Not, a lot of companies will pay them a lower commission than they do pay for, for somebody who's maybe a, a content site because they feel like they're getting less valuable leads and also they're losing that, that piece since they're getting a, a coupon that's subtracting from the, the overall sale. Yes? Um, how did you get started and do you recommend starting with a coupon product? How did I get started at all as an affiliate or? As an affiliate. Um, so, how I got started as an affiliate, so I, um, so way, way back, this is back in 1997, I, I was just uh, desperate for some more income. I was working in publishing in New York City and not making a whole lot of money and just had newly married, just got a house and just needed to pay the bills and I just came across the Amazon affiliate program and just created a very, um, very minimalist site on AOL at the time. It was just uh, like things to do in New York and it was, it was a horrible looking template and I, um, and back then, the, the tracking was pretty primitive. They, they would just email it once every quarter from Amazon. There was no live tracking. And so you could go a quarter without knowing if it was working at all. And so I went two quarters without anything working. And then finally, I started getting some traction. I bought my first domain, and then I did another one and another one. And um, at the same time, I was working in, when I was working in publishing, I, didn't, I was unhappy with that. So I, I answered an ad for a company called MedSite, at the time they were trying to emulate Amazon to sell medical bookstore, medical books online and just copy the whole Amazon model. And so I, um, I went there and I, I just was looking for any kind of new job and it was when everything was exploded with dot-coms in New York and Silicon Alley back then. And so I went there and I, I actually had never taken a, a marketing class or even a, a business class and didn't really know anything about it. I just, I was able to bullshit enough with a couple of terms from the Amazon affiliate program. Like, oh yeah, it clicks. And, and conversion rates, and, and, um, and I was willing to take a low salary, so I got that job. And so I, I was one of the early affiliate managers back then, and so I had to sort of make it up how to actually do an affiliate program back way before blogs and podcasts and forums or anything. And so I, um, so I just sort of came up with ways to recruit affiliates, and, and it was a grind back then because I was trying to get a bunch of medical students to promote medical books, and they'd never heard of affiliate marketing because nobody had. And so I had to spend a half hour, an hour on the phone trying to sell them on the concept. So fortunately, it's a lot easier now. But I, um, at the time, back in 2000, I wrote a book called Successful Affiliate Marketing for Merchants. It was about all the, how to do it back then. But some, it's still on Amazon, but it's pretty old right now. It's, um, there are some ideas in there that are still useful, but a lot of the, even from the time that I wrote it to the time it got published, a lot of the companies that I said were stellar examples of how to do it were out of business, like pets.com. So that was sort of disheartening. That, sort of took away my credibility that I said these were the greatest examples <laughs> and they were gone. But, um, but so that's so how I got started and I've been an affiliate ever since, dating back to 97 in just various niches and things. And, um, and actually, um, speaking of that, if you wanted to just try being an affiliate yourself the, and start from scratch, I, I created a site a couple years ago called extramoneyanswer.com and it's uh, basically just takes you from the, it's in sort of a chapter format of how to just and it's, it's somewhat rudimentary. You can skip chapters if you don't need them. How to get a domain, how to, to pair it up with the hosting, and how to get content ideas, and how to drive traffic and different things. But, but if you're starting from scratch, or you can just skip to like chapter five or whatever, it's a way to just get started as an affiliate to understand what it's all about. Uh, where do you get most of your content from? PLR, or is it uh, unique? Yeah. Where, do you, where do you get your content? Um, so where do I get my content? So, um, so a lot of people will outsource theirs. For me, I, I love writing, so I, I create all my own content, so it's not that scalable. But I, I don't really trust anybody else. If it's, it's supposed to be my site, I don't really like to have to go there and edit it and trust their voice. And, um, and also, one of the big things with, with so many affiliate sites is that the people, they're coming there because they, they trust what they're recommending and, and they, they like a certain voice. And I guess if you have the same person from start to finish on your site, then, then people might think that's your voice. But, but to me, I feel a lot more comfortable just writing all of my own content and make my own videos, podcasts, and things instead of outsourcing it. One more question. One more question. Uh, so 
what is affiliate marketing apply to services? Like which kind of services? Uh, anything, any kind of service. If I'm promoting a service, does it apply? Um, yeah, really anything where there are, or has affiliate marketing applied to services. So really any kind of company that's trying to collect leads of any sort, there's a, that makes sense. It's not just free commerce. So, so it's pretty big with like insurance and financial sectors and different areas like that. So, because if you know what a customer costs for you, then just like you might do paid search, try to get them, you can use affiliate marketing and, and just try to get them that way. And depending on what the, and it, it depends on what, what you're trying to promote. So there might be a limited pool of affiliates if it's something that's got a pretty small audience. So it, it depends, but it, it's worth testing out to, to see, depending on what you're doing. But, um, but uh, a lot of services, B2B services, as well as more commercial services, do very well with affiliate marketing. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Yeah, let me know if you have any questions outside of this. My favorite part of Sean's presentation was that he didn't realize the mics for the room were up here and he kept talking at the laptop. Uh, but that was, that was a really good job. Um, Sean, that was really valuable information. The tips in there, especially if you're new to affiliate marketing, might have seemed a little mundane in some parts, and not, not to discount your presentation, but it was really, really valuable stuff. Things that we use in WP Engine, things I've used in my 20 year career, things other folks use to, to generate billions of dollars in revenue for their businesses. So. Some of those little bullets in there that were just kind of part of a list, there's some really, really good stuff. So I definitely recommend you download that presentation, get back, research more on some of those items, and, and take those actions in your business. Um, every, every company I've worked with in my 20-year career, affiliate marketing was a top three source of customers. So if it's not part of your marketing strategy, spend the time to learn it. So, uh, oh, I did have an answer for the question Sean didn't have about attribution marketing. Uh, I'm actually in the middle of this right now and exploring this with vendors for WP Engine. So the, the, the question was, if, an affiliate, if a visitor comes through and, and jumps off your page to find a coupon code and clicks on an affiliate link on a coupon site, are there solutions so that way that affiliate doesn't either get credit for that or doesn't get full credit for that? Um, there's a service called Impact Radius, which allows you to set rules to say that things are preferred or not preferred sources of traffic. So that tool supports it. Share Sale also has a feature that allows you to have a similar function uh, for those affiliates. and. Uh, Get Ambassador is another platform that allows you to pick between first click and last click attribution. Really nerdy answers, but those are some tools to, to cool. accomplish that. So I, I didn't share no. so it keeps, keeps moving it forward. I love it. Uh, yeah, so this is a, a feature that is not highly advertised in ShareSale. You do have to ask about it, and I'll show you how it works. But you can flag people, and then you can also set the time period. So in other words, if a certain affiliate got a click, they would not get credit for that if there was another affiliate click present for the last 24 hours or 48 hours. In other words, looking to avoid those, those cart abandoners getting paid to a site that might not be adding a lot of value. So there you go. Um, awesome. So our next topics. Now we've learned about affiliate marketing, paying commissions for, for traffic that, uh, that that you get to your site, and only when that traffic generates value on a sale. And now we're going into a much scarier world, a world of unknown results. You you pay before you see the results, uh, but of course you might want to optimize around them. Um, our next speaker I met back in the dot com bubble days, if I'm not mistaken, here and there uh, loosely, but then got to know better um, over time. We both speak at a conference called PubCon, which is actually happening next here next, uh, next week. Oh my God, I should get my flight. Right? <laughs> I think I have that. Um, but a uh, really smart guy, uh, runs uh, Apogee here in town. Did I get that right, Bill? You haven't switched, switched uh, companies yet? Um, really, really smart guy, really knowledgeable in SEO and search in general, but today he's going to be talking about AdWords. So without further ado, Bill Lee. Thank you. I'm, all, I'm only one cup of coffee in, so we'll see how I do with this today. Um, hopefully all of you are either caffeinated or energy drink or ready. Um, just, just a couple quick questions so I can try to tailor the remarks a bit here. Who here would consider themselves more on the technical side of the fence? And who here is more on the business side of the fence? Okay. And, 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 and in terms of who you're trying to reach, are most people, who's trying to reach consumers? About 20%. And the rest, businesses? And are the businesses, are you trying to reach big businesses or small businesses? Big. big. Okay. Because all this is different. I mean, one of the first questions is figuring out who is your target market and what are you trying to target? Just like affiliate marketing can be great at reaching consumers or small businesses, 
it's not always the best way to reach General Electric or Citibank. So kind of understanding kind of who you're trying to market to and, and, and what they're looking for. So this is a somewhat refactored and updated presentation of something I gave at a show called Moz. And then I've added a lot of slides into it. Occasionally, Moz will dip into the world of paid search advertising. Uh, I do recommend, if you care at all about SEO, it is one of the top conferences to go to. It's a great learning environment. Uh, one general rule about marketing is that more arrows are generally good. There's rarely one thing that's going to make it all happen for you. So anyone who comes in and says, I've got the best thing since sliced bread, it's a Facebook ad or it's, it's a Twitter or Snapchat marketing or Google for that matter, rarely do you want to have all your eggs in one basket. So search marketing is a pretty darn good form of marketing. It's not your best form of marketing. Uh, your best form of marketing is probably friends, family, current customers, whether you call it referral marketing, flip the funnel, viral marketing, what have you, but the, the ecosystem of people who already know, like, and trust you. And if you're hitting your growth goals on that, don't write checks to Google. They've got plenty of money. So, you know, work on, work on the early end, the close in, the low-hanging fruit. Your next best form of marketing is probably not search marketing. Your next best form of marketing is probably well-done PR. It's a little bit earlier customer journey, and 98% of PR, I should say 98.3, that way it's a more believable statistical lie. 98.3% um, of PR is not well-done, and that's a whole different problem, and we're not talking about that today. But if you get really good press, Basically, somebody else has already vouched for you. And people are coming in feeling all warm and fuzzy and interested because someone else said that you rock. And that's a great way to start a sales process. With search marketing, they don't always know you yet. But what they are often is in or near a buying cycle. Because fundamentally, people don't go to the web and search for something like timesheet software for fun. Unless they're whacked in the head, and there are plenty of us who are. But in general, the searches that people do on Google are indicative of somebody near a buying process. So they don't know, like, or trust you yet, but they are somewhat close to their wallet. And that's a good thing, and it's a very good thing. So I would say in general, search marketing, it's two aspects, the paid side and the earned side, the SEO side, are probably your third best form of marketing. And that's not bad, given that there are about 40 arrows in the quiver. But you want to you have a mix. You want to be doing a lot of things at once. Uh, one of the key things in search is to integrate it with other things in marketing. And, and I, sh I need to replace this with a customer journey, because that's more gamified, because it kind of looks like, a, like, like the uh, great, great side you had of the affiliate path. I mean, everyone wants to play the game of life. That's more fun than looking at a funnel. So I need, I need, to, I need to refactor this into a buyer's journey. But, but basically, uh, if you're in B2B, in many cases, those visitors to your website are several steps away from being revenue. They end up having to talk to a human. That data goes in a, in a couple of other databases on the other side of your website. First, an email or marketing automation database, and then ultimately a CRM or Salesforce-like database. And a lot of people are not tracking it all the way through. Or they're overriding it, just like with the affiliate marketing program, because they're not keeping track of all the touches. And your Google campaign may bring somebody in who, who's the right person and the right buyer, but they don't actually become sales ready until nine months later when an expensive recently minted MBA with the title of Webinar Boy cl claims 100% credit for the lead and search gets nothing. So one of the interesting things is lay down an attribution map and track this stuff so you can figure out, you know, is Google, is Google adding value? I can't tell you how many, we used to have this thing called Austin Ventures, how many of the Austin Ventures VPs of marketing would go, oh, I, I like search, but really I far prefer email because that's free. And I'd look at them and say, well, actually, that email list was built up by your predecessor who got fired because they weren't tracking stuff properly. But that list got built up at expense. And a lot of times, search is the way you build it. One of the key things before you go out in the digital world, because Google is really good at getting your money, is understand why are we doing this? Very few people become chief marketing officer by maximizing web forms. 
So it has to tie to a deeper thing. Are we doing paid search for market research? Are we doing it like my friend Eric Reese over at the Lean Startup? You know, are we doing it to, to help test out a minimum viable product in the course of developing that product? That's a very, very different way to structure paid search in AdWords than it is if I'm build a sign and I'm tweaking around the edges of an already well-optimized account to get a little bit more out of it. It's set up differently, it's structured differently, it's measured differently. So what, what's our goal? What are we trying to do? Um, is sometimes it's awareness. Uh, other, other, other thought I just want to challenge you with, and, and this was more challenging a few years ago, but, now, but I, I think still we are too attached to our website. And we want to bring everything through our website. Just like in our military, we're attached to carrier battle groups. And it's all about the aircraft carrier. Be thinking about all the other stuff out there. What's going on on Facebook? What's going on on YouTube? What's going on on our partner sites? How do we take advantage of the cluster of content that we influence that's not on our core domain? And think about, think about a diversified strategy. Because more and more things are happening off our website, and not everybody is ready to go to our website right away. So this is actually the whole presentation right here. Because this is what people don't do enough of. I mean, if you just lather, rinse, and repeat on this slide, you welcome to the highly valuable cleaning the latrine with a toothbrush of paid search. This is it. And it's work. And most people in paid search do what I call set and forget. And that's marketing malpractice, and they should be in jail. But unfortunately, our profession is not enough of a profession to do that. But they prey on folks because they tool up an account, and then they walk away, and they don't pay attention. This is it, the three, a, the three ABs. Always be testing. Ad copy. Always have two variants of ad copy running, always in your account. One of the things we do that's, that's just amazingly easy when we look under the hood of someone else's account Okay, there, I just, I knocked it out. I'm, I'm too active. There, that should do it. Uh, there we go, doing something. But we look and see, are they testing multiple variants of ad copy? If they're not, they need to be challenged on that right away. Because you should always be testing. You've got the, and it makes a huge difference in performance. Keywords, always be testing new keywords. Always be testing landing pages and conversion. Uh, and, under, and understand what level of testing you can do given the traffic flow. You need enough traffic to be statistically significant. Not everybody needs Optimizely yet or VWO or, or thank goodness Google's coming back with a tool. We they used to have a great tool then they took it away and now they're giving us one again. Always be measuring. Always be measuring. And then always be asking, what can I learn from this? What am I learning from this data and how can I repurpose it elsewhere? Anyone here do SEO? Anyone here ever been pitched SEO? Okay, for those of you who've been pitched SEO, did the people pitching ask to see your AdWords as part of the pitching process? Good, because 90% of the time, they don't do that. How the heck are you gonna choose keywords without conversion data? Most of the flipping SEO industry still chooses keywords entirely on reach and visibility data, top of funnel data on, Two gazillion people are looking for this. Well, I want to know what are people buying for and buying on my website. And not everybody has a well-developed AdWords account. But if you do, that's SEO gold because you know the money keywords. And, 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 and Dave and I, if, if I happen to be 50% better or 2x better than Dave at SEO, and I don't think I am, uh, you should, probably shouldn't trust me near an SEO account, but he's working a better set of keywords, guess who wins? He does, because it's, it's getting things right at the front end of the process. So always be thinking, what else can I learn from these AdWords? AdWords is market research. You know, one, of the th one of the great things we got now is, when I talk about Google, which Google? Here, here's a search for custom signs. Uh, we did a lot of the foundational work for our friends over at Build a Sign on the SEO side of the fence. <laughs> Look at that. They're ranking number one on search, but where is it? It's all the way down there at the bottom. One thing to keep in mind is, just like Mark Zuckerberg makes everybody pay him, if you want to see posts these days, he gets his pound of flesh. Well, Google does the same thing. 
you know, when there were two at the top and a bunch, well, there were originally none at the top and a bunch on the right, and then there were two on the top and a bunch on the right, this number one SEO listing was a heck of a lot more valuable. Over the last year, Google has made more changes than they have in the last five, almost 10. One of the things they've done, look at this. It's a lot harder to figure out what's an ad. Why would they do that? Gosh golly, I guess they want to make more money. They took away all the sidebar ads other than these. But if you're trying to make money on Google, it's a lot harder to do it on SEO alone. That's the number one listing. On the same search, further down the page, up pops a map, which you can now advertise in. Relatively new thing over the last several years, and they're enhancing that. So there's Google AdWords here as well. Look at poor Vistaprint. That's the number two listing in SEO for a very, very valuable keyword, custom signs. They're, they're pretty much, who goes there at that point? They, uh, Google stripped, a, a, for many monetizable searches, Google's actively working to get more money from your pocket and to make SEO less valuable because they're putting all that other stuff in there. So something to keep in mind. It's frustrating. Which search engine? Product listing ads. Uh, if you are selling a product that a bunch of other people are selling, this is the Google paid search engine that you need to play in. It's kind of sort of their answer to being on the losing side of the field from Amazon. So Google was fighting pretty effectively against Amazon until Facebook popped up. And then Google took their eye a little bit off of the Amazon ball and went to, went to fight Facebook and mobile and phones and all that. Now they're kind of getting back into the game, but it's probably too little too late. If you're looking for something to buy that's a consumer product, where do you go? Most people start on Amazon because they just assume Amazon will have it, and then if Amazon doesn't, search number two happens at Google. But if you're a retailer and you're selling stuff that other people are selling, you gotta play on product listing ads, and that's a much more technical AdWords campaign than a normal text-based one. It's managing data feeds, it's, it's writing scripts, it's, it's moving large sets of data around, it's having the right tools. Uh, mobile ads uh, in the map, and Enhanced mobile ads are coming out that are, that are going to really, really affect this a lot. They're, they're whole expanded text ad listings in, in the maps. I mean, when you're looking at a small screen, how many search results do you look at? Fewer, right? Because it's a pain in the butt looking at that screen. So being at the top is even more valuable, and yet most of what people are going to see is going to be an ad uh, on Google. Keep in mind which search. Don't forget YouTube. Almost none of your competitors are doing pay-per-click ads in YouTube. And amazingly, human beings seem to enjoy watching what I call talkies, this new thing, moving, talking, colorized pictures. They even do it on the internet, I hear. They even do it on mobile phones. Go figure. And yet very few people are advertising here relative to Google Classic. So it's, it's an opportunity for you to get a lot done with a little. This is a, this is a boring, uh, this is a company I worked at for a couple years, so I shouldn't call them boring, but they're B2B enterprise tech, and they sell to Fortune, you know, global 2,000 size entities, and they did an SAP survey. That's pretty, well, it's, it's pretty pedestrian stuff. Uh, it doesn't get the chilies hot for a lot of the folks here at Capital Factory, right, because we're trying to write the apps that will change the world. So. They did a survey. We, we got over 217,000 views on this because we seeded the collection plate and we catalyzed the video with heavy, heavy classic Google ads, but also YouTube ads. And we did it right around the time of SAP's giant user conference called Sapphire. So when there was a lot of searches going on for the event, and we spent hardly anything relative to the normal monthly paid search budget. So think about developing conversion catchment devices within YouTube, because a lot of your competitors aren't. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge opportunity. Um, yeah, another thing, crazy thought, but these guys are still around. We, we, we have a client that last week, even though Bing is about 15% of the market, 30% of the sales of that client came from Bing. 
and at a far lower cost per acquisition. And why is that? Because people forget it. And even if they haven't forgot it, who here's running AdWords accounts? Okay, keep your hand up if you were in AdWords last week. Okay, who was in Bing last week? <laughs> Okay, we still have one hand up, all the rest went in. And, and the reason is, if you're running AdWords and you're saying, what's the best use of the next hour of my time, the answer is almost always Google. And they never quite get around to Bing. Or you, you import your Google campaign once a quarter to Bing and you spend a, you spend a few hours tweaking it and then you let it run. We, we were looking under the hood of an account that was spending seven figures a month on Google. That starts to be real money. Uh, and, and the Google account was not disastrous. They were spending a quarter million dollars a month on Bing, and no human had been in that account in six weeks. Again, I, I think that's malpractice. So if your budget gets big enough, actually consider having a second human do Bing, put Bing specifically on your calendar to force yourself to do Bing, or have you know, an agency do Bing and keep the other thing in-house, but ensure that it gets worked. It's different enough that it makes a difference. And the other, two other beautiful things about Bing, it's a less efficient market. Because all your competitors are being lazy about Bing too. So you're typically going to get a better return on it. You won't get as much of a return because they're you know, you know, it's, it's, it's not the gorilla, it's the chimpanzee of the space, but they're real people too. And actually, well, three things about Bing. There's that. Uh, there's, there's money to be made and good money to be made. Secondarily, not all of us have the budget to effectively play at the high-stakes poker table of Google. If you're in a hyper-competitive space like hosting and you haven't executed as well as our friends at WP Engine and you got a smaller budget, maybe you can't play at the big boy blackjack tables. Maybe you got to play at the Bing table. So if you have limited budget, you might even consider doing an all Bing approach and make that work first. Because you can make money there and your competitors are not paying attention to it. And you know, when you got spaces like Rackspace and hosting, you know, that, that are spending seven figures a month, you can easily spend fifty grand a month in Bing or other spaces. Five, we 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 helped out one outfit in the in the contact space and they were playing against one eight hundred contacts. They didn't have much of a budget. So for them it's like don't even play Google, just play Bing. And make that work and then once you've made that and that's the low-hanging fruit then once you've made that work then go then go into Google but don't start with Google so sometimes it's that the other thing to keep in mind about Bing is it's a slightly different demographic than Google and for some of you it might actually be a better demographic it skews a little bit older because sometimes people get a computer with Windows that starts with Bing and they never switch so it's, it's a little bit older. It's also a little bit more female than the standard Google user. Interestingly enough, it's a little bit richer and a little bit poorer. So it's a little less middle class. So it, it's just a slightly different demographics, but it is absolutely worth testing. Uh, here, here's a grab bag of other stuff to try. Uh, so these things are a little bit more advanced. Uh, we'll go through each and every one of them. One of the things Procter & Gamble does really well with HEB and supermarkets is they try to run the table, right, with cereal brands, toothpaste brands, detergent brands. There are opportunities to do that with Google. If you are a market leader and have budget, not everybody does. Back in the day, when we still had this right side here, you could do a lot of cool stuff like this and have multiple horses in the race and basically drive your competitors off of the Google map. It's still possible to do this. Uh, one of our clients, uh, ShipStation, which is a division of Stamps.com, Stamps.com owns ShipStation, they own Shipping Easy, and they own Edicia. So if you're in the shipping software space and you're trying to get found on Google, well, these guys have taken up 75% of the ads. So if you're a market leader, again, we all will be, we might not all be there today, but some of the guys like at WP Engine, if you're looking for specifically WordPress hosting, figure out how do I create, back to that earlier slide I talked about, think beyond your website. How do I create sites that I influence and control 
so I can have an unfair share of the Google market. Uh, another thing to think about that's advanced, combine paid and earned media strategies. There's an interesting gap in the market where ad agencies, anyone here from an ad agency before I get too offensive? Okay. Anyone here fancy themselves a creative but they weren't really good enough so now they work for an ad agency because their real art wasn't good enough? So, so now, they're, now they're looking for, for clients because they think client and patron are the same word and now you exist to fund their art. Well, there are lots of ad agencies out there, great people in them, wonderful art, creative work. They understand paid media, but for them, it's paid media to promote their art. They want you, the patron, I mean a client, to spend your money on media so other people can see their art. So they, they get paid media. On the other hand, we've got the PR firms, and, and there's some exceptions, like Josh Jones Dilworth, big exception, great, great at what he does. He understands the blend. But PR firms typically say, well, paid media, that's if you weren't good enough to get earned media, because earned media is far more credible. And you know what? Earned media is far more credible. You know, back when we used to see both, when Google was this, and we'd spend all day, because we're just such exciting people, staring at both sides of Google, you know, we, we understood there's a blend between the two. And if you actually get a PR win, why wouldn't you promote the heck out of it? And now you can use cost per click things like Outbrain and Taboola to do that as well. There are a whole bunch of other technologies, but if you get a PR win and you have some paid media budget, pour the paid media gasoline on the fire and amplify it and increase the odds of it getting shared and going viral. Larry Kim does a great job talking about this and, and some of the stuff he has at WordStreamer with social sharing and whatnot. But it can, be, uh, it can be more shelf space. So if you get a press release win, consider doing AdWords into the press release itself. So if somebody picks up your, your press release, they write an article about it, you get a favorable piece in the Austin Business Journal, something like that, and it talks about your Gartner category, talks about your product, if someone's going and searching on Google like this, consider actually spending some paid search into the article, living off of your website. Increase the readership of it. And everybody likes that. At one point, we made the, most, the single most read blog post ever on InfoWeek because the InfoWeek person had written something very favorable about a client of ours. And we just, on their Gartner and Forrester categories, just drove traffic into it, into it over and over again. Well, the publisher loves that because they can charge more for advertising on InfoWeek now because it's all based on site traffic. The journalist loves that because they like to see their things read. Customers are seeing an ad word that says, what does InfoWeek say about this space? Oh my goodness, InfoWeek must have the answer. Let's go there. It's far more credible than taking them to our website. Uh, and, and it was a win all around. So consider that if you get a PR win. And, and PR wins are not as hard to come by as they used to be because anybody can be a Forbes columnist these days. It's not so hard. <laughs> Everybody's looking for free content. So it's, it can be easier to plant these things. And even if you can't plant them, if you've got budget, there are a bunch of outfits like this. Heck, you could even do this with Gardner. Um, you know, CFO Magazine has a pay-per-lead white paper program. Lots of people have those. Well, you are having to pay a certain amount, a $15, $25 bounty every time someone downloads that white paper, but it gives you an opportunity to have your content live on somebody else's site that has a far more credible domain and use your AdWords dollars to drive people there and you will get the contact info. And again, another way of doing that shelf space. One of the only other areas of marketing besides digital that is growing Digital is growing at double digits. This is growing at single digits, but it's event marketing. Does anyone here attend events? Probably not, because you're here, right? Um, so people attend events, and people attend a lot of events. And you can tell by an event what people are attending. Almost nobody, 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 buys event names on Google. It's a great way of getting relatively cost-effective traffic before the event and during the event. How anyone here go to Google and put the words Austin Startup Week in Google before coming here? Anyone do that multiple, multiple times? 
There's lots of traffic around events. If you know events that you want to go to, if you're a startup and you know events you can't afford to go to, like a bunch of the TechCrunch things or the demo things, you can buy their name and have something. You can have a virtual non-event attendance event for the people searching for the event. And put in a note, gosh golly, nobody bought Austin Startup Week. So it's, it's something to test, something to try. Um, doesn't work for everybody, but you know, that's a beautiful thing about this. You can get out here and test a lot of these things cheaply and find out what works. Uh, this is one of the few areas of Twitter that work. I'm really down on Twitter in most cases. It can be useful for getting in front of influencers on a cost per click basis. It can also be very helpful around events where you want to float above an event on the hashtag. So consider doing that if you're already laying down the money to attend an event. You may want to take over the hashtags as well. It's probably a lot less expensive than the cost of your booth. Um, also, look at your SEM traffic with web analytics and figure out what else can I learn from that. What can you learn? If Google brings somebody to your website, even if they don't fill out a form, what can you usually tell if they're a business person? what company they were. So in demand-based and account-based marketing, other folks have built some things on top of this. But you want to roll this right back immediately as well to a ReachForce or a Hoover's or a Data.com or some sort of site and say, who in this company is likely to have the roles that would be interested in this? And now what is our outbound response to them? So in some respects, view that little ping on your website, even if they didn't fill out a form. As, as an inquiry, because again, people don't look for timesheet software for fun. If they do fill out a form, a lot of times the person who fills out a form, if we're B2B, is not the same person as the buyer. It may be the summer intern, it may be a tech person doing research, uh, you know. So how do I, what they used to, in old school sales, they call blue sheeting an account. How do I build out the cluster of other people who are probably involved in that sales process? So every time, if it costs me 50 or 100 bucks to get a form filled out and I get a name, why wouldn't I spend three to five bucks a name or less to build out five more? And then have my outbound efforts focus on all of those. And that's an opportunity to ensure that the account gets scoped properly. It's also an opportunity to take an account that might be starting just in a division and, and, and move it off to a more of an enterprise sale or a broader level. We're able to say, hey, we, we notice that people are looking in division A and B. Should we talk to corporate and figure out a, a master purchasing vehicle here? So think about other data sets from your SEM traffic. So there's that. Um, and then think down funnel. A lot of people are doing this, but not enough. So if I can just get optimization data one level down the funnel of a human being has talked to the form and has done this, good lead, bad lead, just that simple level of data, it generally changes the way we spend money on Google and Bing by at least 43%. So, you know, make sure that when possible, you're funneling that data back. When possible, have a very long attribution cycle too so I can figure out what's promoting six months from now and nine months from now. Because otherwise, I'll turn off all the searches that generate early customer journey stuff because they don't look like they're converting. So I need to have different categories of keywords by where they are in the buyer's funnel and not turn them off. Uh, here's a, here's a, we see this a lot. We see this a lot. It's just tragic where people look at, anyone here do new websites? Yeah, because we get bored, right? And the, web, the website, uh, you know, memes change. We gotta, you know, always be up to date with uh, the latest website. So client came out with a new website. Everyone's thinking, woohoo, web developer rocked it. Uh, well, but not. So again, make sure you, you're going below the level of web forms. Something that looks like it's doing better may not actually be doing better. So th this one, uh, you know, it was converting a lot more leads, but the leads weren't converting to sales. And so, you know, that, that's one of the fallacies of, and you'll get, you'll get the test Brian Massey on this because he's great, but the conversion industry sometimes over-optimizes 
at this level of the funnel to the detriment of things above it and things below it. So you need to be thinking full funnel. You need to understand your funnel or your buyer's journey and be thinking global optimization along the whole piece of it. Because I can get you a great conversion rate. It ain't hard. I have an ad word that says free bags of money. And then I have a landing page that says fill me out for your free bag of money. And they just never get a free bag of money. But I have a great looking conversion rate. So, you know, it's not that hard to get conversions. It's hard to get dollars. And we need to be tracking as much to the dollar as we can. Um, so this is another thing to keep in mind. Anyone here ultimately expect to have to talk to another human? A lot of people, okay, good. Because a lot of us, you know, a lot of people who are my friends who are technical folks, I mean, in fact, the interesting thing about ShipStation and Shipping Easy, ShipStation is a client, they built their website and their product and their demo so well that when they talk to humans, it's just support and retention. They can get through the entirety of the sales process without having to talk to a human most of the time. It's sort of a, tech, it's sort of a technologist's dream. Like, how do I make it so good that people just buy the stuff? Uh, shipping Easy, on the other hand, um, it may ship easily, but it doesn't sell easily. <laughs> so they, they have a model where they have to talk to people all the time. And so if you have to talk to people, if you've got a high dollar sale, it's a new space and people don't know it, if there are multiple people involved in the process or it takes time, think about how do I take down my website conversion rate and how do I increase my phones. And Google's made that a lot easier lately by being able to have phones and extensions and phones and things. But if you don't track it, you're going to take it on the chin from you know your 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 marketing VP because they'll say, well, you know, you're not you're not getting the shopping cart conversions, or you're not getting the leads. So paid search, in a sense, is kind of like bringing milk straight in to the to the uh, to the store straight off of the cow. And it's not homogenized, and it's not pasteurized, and it still has the cream. And some people are ready to buy. If they're ready to buy, skim that cream off, take it right, make it butter right away. But track that so you don't penalize the paid search manager for saying, well, gee, this milk is pretty low fat now. And that happens a lot. It happens a lot. So you should be doing chat. You should be doing phone calls. There are a couple of easy ways to get it done. I won't go into the, the weeds here, but it's, it's on the uh, prezo that you guys all have. A uh, couple other things. If you paid money to get someone to your website, pay an extra little bit of money to follow them around the web with little tiny ads. Because then you look really big. And oftentimes at 50% to 3x is your ROI on your paid search campaigns. Because you're now everywhere. And you're, you're it's like, gee, I, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing WP Engine everywhere. They, they must be huge. And it keeps you in that consideration set and sort of lubricates the rest of the sales process. Uh, another thing to uh, keep in mind is uh, who here wants to do something that's pretty different from the other stuff that's out there. So one of the problems with that is that if it's new, people aren't searching for it. So definitionally, search is really good at covering existing categories where people say, I think I want one of these. But if you're the first person that comes up with something totally different, like an iPad, well, what, people aren't looking for it. So if you have something that's truly revolutionary, you might not want to do a lot of search. We've, we've had some clients where we've actually swapped it and we do a lot more social advertising and display, which is more awareness and education, or Outbrain and Taboola into a blog post or PR win so it, because it's even higher funnel. We have to create the awareness before we can fulfill the demand. So also understand how revolutionary is your product? Are people searching for it? If they're not, then you have to educate the market first and Google will take money for you for that, but don't do it on AdWords, because that won't be your low-hanging fruit. Um, I hopefully we have some time for questions. Um, I'm still studying this stuff. I've been studying it for a long time. And the more I study it, the more I realize uh, there are no experts. Uh, that being said, there, there are a lot of people who shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> I'm probably one of those two, but it's cool stuff. And, and Google has changed so much in the last year. Uh, on AdWords and paid search. It, it is absolutely phenomenal. So it was getting kind of boring, and it's not anymore. Oh, yeah, yeah. How about, and, and, and Sean, feel free to chime in on, this, on any question they ask, too. All right. 
Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned a tool that Google took away and mm -hmm. they're going to be bringing back soon. Could you elaborate on that? Sure. Well, it's, they're actually not bringing back exactly the same thing, but they had something called Google Website Optimizer, which was a multivariate testing tool. And it, it, it was one of those um, four-letter F words that come from German that are like the most powerful words in our language. Fear, food, free. Um, it was free. And uh, the other folks out there were charging many thousands a month. And it was a great tool. Well, they took it away. Um, and now they're, they're relaunching another optimization tool. So those of us who are big fans of and use tools like Optimizely, uh, that, that's a great tool, but it's, it's kind of pricey. And not all of our, our smaller clients that are still kind of in the growth hacking and launch mode, it's not a great fit for. And some of the other tools just don't really have all the features and functionality for it. So uh, they're, they're, they're relaunching a conversion tool, which is, which is pretty exciting stuff. Because Google's of two minds of it. I like it because it means that my clients don't need to spend as much money with Google, or if they spend the same amount of money with Google, it goes significantly further if I'm able to do optimization as far down the funnel as I can. Yes, sir. Is there anything that you can do taking these techniques like on the web and do that inside of that? There are there are there are some app store uh, paid and uh, uh, I'm more familiar with the things you can do with app store optimization from the SEO side. So, but you know, app store marketing is a is a subset of digital marketing and and there are things you can do. I'm I'm. I've got some people on my team who know more about that. I, I'm, I know more about what they think, some of the things you can do within Amazon if you're on that side. If I reach out to you through your yeah. social media, do you have a connection? Absolutely. Yeah, I should, I should be easy, easy to find. And, and the beautiful thing is if you follow me on Twitter, I don't tweet, but I do get messages. Well, it's just, does anyone tweet anymore? It's kind of, kind of like an echo chamber these days. I mean, Twitter's, I mean, who are they saying is going to buy it now? Uh, the latest acquisition rumors, maybe it was Salesforce. Yes. What if you're looking to market only to people in Texas or certain cities? Like Great question. So Google has gotten very, very good at geotargeting. Now there are still going to be some false positives, but you can you can hyper target folks on Google by state, by metro area, and and in some cases almost almost even by neighborhood. So you can you can get pretty finely tuned with targeting. It's not. It's not quite as finely tuned as Facebook advertising, but you can, um, particularly in the, in the maps part of Google where you're defining service areas and, and you have a lot of definitional ability there, you can, you can laser target. And we've had to do this. We had a chain of uh, urgent care centers that we built out and did all the paid search for it. And they really didn't want people beyond a certain number of miles because you're not going to drive that far. So there are, a lot of, there are a lot of things now, particularly with mobile, that have local intent and Google's gotten far better at geotargeting. And they're really good at geotargeting with a mobile phone because they have locational different uh, stuff. But on a desktop, there, there's going to be a little bit more of a false positive on that. How does that relate to the cost, which say you might not necessarily have the money to use Google? Well, the, the, the smaller an area you're targeting, the less expensive it is. And so for a lot of, in a lot of cases, we'll, we'll have clients, if they have locations, and they also have an e-store or a national presence or wherever they have their corporate headquarters. We'll have two different campaigns set up in Google. We'll have one that's the generic campaign, and then we'll have ones that are set up to specifically target regions where they have some sort of advantage or they have a different message. In fact, we, we have, sometimes it makes sense to uh, like have a different camp. If you've got one major competitor and you just want to play psycho games with them, you know, you can have different ads showing up just in the town where they're headquartered. So, you know, you can do, or just, in fact, in some cases, just to their IP address. <laughs> so you can, there, there are a lot of fun things you can do with locational targeting. Bing does not have that. Bing has, Bing has that. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, let's say you're at a company that hasn't done any search before mm -hmm. and you're just starting out. Yeah. Uh, Mm -hmm. Where do you start and what are your resources for learning more about that? Well, Google, Google has great resources themselves, uh, and I'd start with that. Uh, I mean, getting certified 
you know, having Google certify you as being competent to spend money with Google is not a, not a very difficult process. They, they, they really want to have lots of people running around with certificates saying, I can help you spend money on Google. Uh, getting good is a very different story. But, but they, have, they have a great basic set of resources. There, there are four or five places on the industry, like Search Engine Land, that have great paid search content that you can go uh, look at as well. I, I'm a big fan of, of go for the low-hanging fruit first. So figure out what are the searches that indicate that somebody's actively in the market, not top of funnel or early customer journey. Look and see what are other people doing in terms of AdWords. Uh, look and see, because that's all out there, it's beautiful, you can see their ads. And figure out, well, based on what they're saying, how, how do you differentiate? Uh, many people put their AdWords on autopilot, and many people have what I would consider to be not their top human resources running the AdWords campaigns. Uh, sometimes it's the Salesforce administrator running them. And, and they went out and they read Google AdWords for dummies. And then all the ads look exactly alike. Uh, one time we actually had an ad that performed phenomenally well because everybody had, ad, uh, had read Google AdWords for dummies and we had, we had a client in the, in the vacuum space and I was just goofy. I, 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 I said to test something on the team and they didn't want to test it, but our ad copy was, we suck more. <laughs> and that won't work for most people, but it had a humor element and it stood out. So be thinking, you're trying to catch their attention in that AdWord. How, how can you do that? And one of the best ways is well, what's already there, how do I be different? And whether that's funny, whether it's a value statement, but, but uh, you know, and, and in that little bit of haiku, which is doubling, by the way, so with expanded ads now, Google's driving SEO even further down the front page. But you've got more space to tell your story now with Google than you ever had before. One more question. Okay. Sure. Yes, sir. You mentioned um, checking the conversion rates all the way down the funnel. Mm -hmm. Is there, what's the best way to do that, especially for like large scale sales, like 10K? Yeah, I, I, would, I would say the key thing is you want to assign tracking codes to all your marketing campaigns. And you want, you need to define your single source of truth, which is probably your CRM system like Salesforce. And you want a part of it that keeps track of all the touches. So you can tell first touch, you can tell intermediate touches, and you can tell last touch. And then at some point, once you've gathered enough data, you can have a robust family feud about attribution. But you can't even really have that. You can have that feud emotionally, which really does nobody any good. What you want to do is you want to have that feud with data. And there's not necessarily a right answer about attribution, but there are wrong answers. And giving everything to last touch is a wrong answer, and giving everything to first touch is a wrong answer. Uh, but it's important to do that, and, and it's usually your CRM system. It's some sort of database that is further down funnel that is shared by marketing and sales. Um, you know, it, it's funny, like at eBay, their optimization team, their paid search team is over here, their optimization team actually reports up to the CFO and finance owns that database. But they're, they're B to C and a little odd, but it's, it's, it's an interesting way they've structured it. Usually, usually it's, it's, it's going to be in the sales database, in the CRM database that tracks all that. But some, some, people, are, some people are at least tracking the intermediate things in the, uh, the, the Marketo or Eloqua or Infusionsoft or Acton or you know, whatever, whatever the, uh, the email database is. Because more and more of those are robust enough to track multiple things. All right. Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming out and uh, thank, uh, one more round of applause for our speakers. Please.